All right. Uh, welcome to Building a More Resilient Future with Advanced Cloud Provider Testing. Uh, let's see. I'm Bridget Crumhout. Um, I am a product manager at Microsoft Azure, and I'm a co-chair of SIG Cloud Provider, and uh, very active in a number of Kubernetes-related communities. Uh, I think that I think Omiko and I overlap in at least two or three other communities as well. Yeah, definitely. You, you definitely get into several communities here. Uh, my name is Michael McCune, and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I am the other co-chair of SIG Cloud Provider, uh, and I tend to work on cloud provider-related things, and I also maintain uh, Cluster Autoscaler and the new Carpenter Cluster API provider. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to start by talking a little bit about the history of cloud providers and Kubernetes. Then we're going to talk about testing and why cloud controllers uh, make it complicated. And I think this is, this is kind of the, the high-level overview. Like We will break down a lot more specifics around how we're going to include more providers in testing. But probably the, the important thing to realize here is that there's a lot going on in cloud provider testing, but you don't have to work at a cloud provider to participate in it. So. We're going to start by looking at a little Kubernetes history lesson here. Uh, and we did a little research to look into the history of cloud providers in Kubernetes to help set up the context for what we're talking about today. So back, way, way back in about two, two, 2016, late 2015, when 1.0 uh, Kubernetes was tagged, Cloud provider code existed in Kubernetes at that time. And when I was looking back at this, you know, we saw the, some of the big names that we're familiar with, like you know, your AWSs and your GCPs, uh, but I thought it was interesting. There was also a Mesos uh, provider in there as well. Um, I don't know when that got removed, but it was just interesting to see. Um, and as we go forward, we get up to the 1.13 release, and at this point, when we look through the history of, of Git issues, we can see the Kubernetes community is already starting to interrogate itself about should we have this cloud provider specific code in the core? Yeah, and that's, I think that's the important point there is we realized that there were pros and cons to everything, but as the proliferation of cloud providers continued, it really didn't make sense to have it um, embedded and mingled into the core. And we're thinking, okay, great. So then we remove cloud providers from core, and, and then we're done, right? And <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, if you look at the timeline here, you can see that in, in about 2018, in the 113 release, we created CAP 2395, which was proposing the removal of this. And it took us all the way until 2023, close to 2024, where we finally reached the stable state for this, and now that code has been removed but we still have a little bit of code left in some of the testing repositories. And I just wanna, I'll just give you a, a warning now. You might wanna have your cameras ready. This is a QR code rich deck. Uh, so you'll see a lot of links to things. This is a link to a retrospective we did after we completed the migration. So maybe something interesting to read about the whole process. Yeah. And, and we should say, by the way, um, in the retrospective, I think one of the things that came up is like with the provider specific code being removed, that also opens up some opportunities for changing how we do testing. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is why is improving the testing important for us, right? And, um, you know, Automated testing leads to earlier detection of bugs and regressions, right? And we've got a little graph after this we can kind of show some of that. Um, and it, should it, it's kind of fun just to even ask people, like, does anyone actually believe that testing is important? Uh, yeah, okay, I think everyone probably. <laughs> does, does anybody believe testing's not important? Let's put it that way. Should <laughs> but, we just, um, you know? Does anybody, like, but the thing is, even if we all believe testing is important, committing to doing it is a very different thing. Right, and, and currently the cloud provider testing we're doing is uh, limited in, in several ways, and what we'd like to do is expand that, and you can see here, you know, we're talking about kind of documenting things, making repeatable patterns and whatnot, and I think, you know, what we believe this contributes to is just better reliability and confidence for these new components that have now been taken out of the tree. 
Yeah, and it also makes for a more equitable playing field because we want to make sure that all providers can be, um, you know, on a level playing field. And if you have consistent testing that lets everyone see, is my provider, you know, up to snuff? Is it meeting where it needs to be? That's a little better than saying, oh, these are the providers that we've tested well and who knows about you? Right, we don't right. want to do that. You're right. We, we can't just say, well, we test on one or two providers, and therefore we assume the rest of them work the way we expect. And the reason we might want to test is um, kind of obvious when we look at this graph, right? <laughs> right, right. So first of all, I, d I don't think he's in the room, but shout out to Jordan Liggett for putting together all this data for us, uh, not for us specifically, but for the wider Kubernetes community. And this is looking at uh, regression fixes uh, per minor release going back to 1.19. Um, and so I think, you know, Obviously, you can see we still have regressions. We're still dealing with this. But I think the interesting thing is that as we come forward in time, we're starting to see less and less. And, you know, I don't want to get into correlation and causation here, but we certainly have improved tests over time. And the general thinking is if we can do more of this earlier in the process, we can make this graph even better in the future. And we might want to clarify what people are looking at here. Um, as every Kubernetes release goes on, um, patch releases come out over the you know year that a Kubernetes release is being supported. And if there's a regression in a patch release, that means that everyone who thought that they were good, they thought that everything was okay with that version of Kubernetes that they were running, suddenly something breaks that they weren't expecting. That's not something that we want to do. Like, right. It's pretty important to not do that. Right. And, and also, we, th we have to think about then backports and whatnot as well, right? So if we see a regression coming through several versions, we have to make a serious calculation about how far do we backport this. And that might require backporting tests for the functionality as well to improve it. And it, yeah. if, you were, if you've been to some of the SIG testing talks, like backporting regressions through tests is, is kind of a sticky subject. And so this is, this is a, I would say this is a sidebar that'll be a whole different talk, so we won't go into detail about it here. But when you think to yourself, why is it that nobody will let me backport this simple bug fix? I really just want to backport it to all of the currently supported versions of Kubernetes because hashtag probably fine. Um, it might not be fine, and they might be saying, there's possibilities that that could break something in the past that we really don't want to do. Yeah. Because we've done that a bunch. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of testing that goes on in Kubernetes, a lot of different areas. What makes testing cloud providers so complex? I feel like that one is really fascinating because you can imagine if you say, oh, we have to have an endpoint. We have to have a test. Um, please add some tests. When people tell you, please add some tests, and you're thinking, cool, I can add an endpoint. It could return 200, OK? I mean, that's an answer, right? <laughs> it's like, well, maybe it's not the answer you want to return. Like, what's the purpose of the test, right? Right. And, and with the cloud controllers, where this becomes really interesting is that every cloud is going to operate in a slightly different manner. But the cloud controllers bring some uh, semblance of consistency to the behavior. And so we want, on one hand, on the Kubernetes side, we want the cloud controllers to be accurately reporting things like lifecycle controls when instances disappear in the cloud. But that requires very specific code to speak to that cloud to understand how to remove an instance to create the test, and then how to detect that it's gone. So each provider is going to need custom code to kind of create these conditions. And then additionally, you have to be running those tests on that provider. Yeah, and, and another example would be like managing service back load balancers. Excellent. It's going to vary between providers. And so that's not something that can be either code-wise in upstream Kubernetes or tested in the upstream Kubernetes test grid. Right, absolutely. And some providers may not even have things like, uh, like load balancing services and whatnot. So you, there might not be anything like that. And I think that this is kind of an interesting question. It's maybe a philosophical question. Is like, where should the new custom code live? Right. <laughs> so we, we've just pulled all of this custom code out of Kubernetes. We're not going to just put it back in for the testing. So uh, what are we proposing then? I mean, honestly, it's this exciting, the exciting future that you can help build um, is the next generation of cloud providers. because. If we're thinking at this point, if we're, we, we basically want 
one interface to rule them all and in the darkness bind them, right? Absolutely. <laughs> So. Yeah, no, for sure. And and so the way that we want to do this is follow some of the other patterns in Kubernetes, like uh, the container storage interface or the container network interface, where we can have a common set of tests that live in the Kubernetes repository that the entire community can agree on in terms of the behavior we'd like to see. And then we can allow each cloud provider to control their own implementation of how those tests are expressed. So the tests get run the same for everyone, but each cloud provider could create their interface so that it runs on their cloud the way we expect. So that gives you the best of both worlds um, because then that also, and this is really important for anybody who's ever said, why are there flaky tests that are slowing things down or using too many cloud resources, um, is we don't want the Kubernetes itself or the Kubernetes release itself to depend on these external repositories. Right, yeah, exactly. And so we don't want to have code that lives in the main Kubernetes repository that is cloud provider specific that might lead us to a blocking condition where now the release is blocked based on some very specific activity and you know we'll have to find an expert to debug it and you know all that lovely yeah. stuff. And we went to all the effort of having the infrastructure be community controlled. So we want that to be what gates the release. Right, absolutely. So what will this actually mean though, right? Like we just mentioned, we'll have a consistent set of tests that could be run on every cloud provider and we can expect the same behavior to come out of them. Um, and it's important to note that the tests I'm talking here are not part of the official conformance suite, right? These are just part of the end-to-end -end tests. The conformance tests are largely focused on provider agnostic behaviors. So this would not be included in the official conformance suite, but this would be included in the end-to-end -end tests for Kubernetes. Yeah. And each provider can run the tests on their own just to gain confidence in their releases. Right. So what we're really proposing here is that each cloud provider will own an implementation of the interface that allows their tests to run in their cloud provider repo. So those developers and maintainers can accelerate or, or keep their own cadence that doesn't necessarily have to be dependent on the Kubernetes repo. And then, like you said, they can run the tests on their own and exercise them and, and get good results and then bring it back to the community. Yeah, and I mean, if they want to, there are pathways to like, you know, involve their tests and infrastructure into the Kubernetes community processes. More on that later. Yeah, absolutely, and that's something that, I mean, I'm kind of excited about as, as an optimist looking forward. So, which, uh, which kind of tests are we talking about here? And I feel like this, I, I immediately, I'm not a visual learner, so I immediately look at this and I think, what am I looking at? What does this mean? Why are there so many clouds? What is happening? Yeah, right, right, exactly. So I put this slide in here uh, to help for people who might want to visualize what this looks like. And so what, in the center, center-ish, we see Kubernetes, Kubernetes at GitHub. And that is the repository for all the Kubernetes code and all the test code. So the test code lives there, as well as a definition of the cloud provider interface to the testing. Then we have separate repositories, cloud provider AWS, cloud provider Azure. Those are maintained by the individual project teams. The implementation of the interface will live in those repositories. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that really helps us see how it would go. But let's go deeper. Right. So how does this actually become a test then? So I'm, I'm using OpenStack as an example here. Um, so we take the Kubernetes, on the, all the way on the left, you see the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo and the cloud provider OpenStack repo. The, basically, the tests are compiled from the cloud provider OpenStack repo with a dependency on the main Kubernetes repo. So Kubernetes does not depend on the external cloud provider, it's the other way around. Yeah. And it's, I think that's important, especially when you start saying repo and people are thinking about GitHub and they're like, wait, sub submodules, what? And it's like, no, no, it's dependency. Right, just pure dependency. This doesn't require any sort of special knitting together of the repositories. Right. So, through a compilation process, you end up with a test binary that contains, uh, or the, you end up with a binary that contains the tests for that specific cloud uh, controller. Then, and this, this is the part that uh, we were just talking about kind of optimistically, that workload needs to be run on a Kubernetes running on that infrastructure. So in this case, we need an OpenStack deployed Kubernetes that we can run the cloud controller on because it's not gonna work if we run it on Azure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And by the way, I think it's worth noting that this 
process that we're describing here would all be running through the Cube CI system. Yeah, absolutely. So what we want to do is get to the point where we can define a process that this can run through the same, you know, pre-submit, post-submit periodics uh, that we all love, and in that respect, we can really get this further into the uh, into the upstream maintenance process. Yeah, and that means. There is, there's pros and cons, because there's limited storage for artifacts, obviously, but then there's also history to look at. So, yeah, so let's look at a little bit more. Yeah, so, yeah, let's get into observing the history. How, how many people here are familiar with this view of test grid? Yeah, we got okay, some okay, test grid users. People. So what we're looking at here is something called test grid. And uh, the QR code here will take you to this page. And this is the page that we look at uh, as a SIG because this is showing us uh, the GCP periodic tests for cloud controllers. And in this case, uh, this looks pretty good. Everything's green. And you can see on the left-hand side, it's, it's really difficult to read, but those are all different names of tests. And on the right-hand side are dates and times that link up with specific test runs. And don't worry about it being difficult to read because that QR code will take you right to the actual live one and you can go look at it yourself. Right, so. you can explore through these and, you know, who knows? I took this picture early when we were making the slide decks and then I went back and took another picture to add another slide. <laughs> <laughs> and we found some errors that came up. And I think that that's important to think about too, because of what you're what you're looking at when you're looking at test grid is it shows you historical data, it shows you patterns, it shows you the ways that you can investigate failures. And so I think that that's it's valuable just to step through some of how would we look at a failure. Right. And so this, I took this picture to try and illustrate, and it might be difficult to see, but there's a little black smudge up there, which is the. Uh, which is the mouse cursor over that one F that's on the top line. And you can see across the top, it's telling us there's a failure. Uh, and we can, we can click through to see what that failure was and what test failed. Before I do that, though, I just want to shout out a, call, a talk from uh, some of our colleagues, uh, Ben and Antonio and Michelle. And this is one of the magical things, by the way, about being late in the conference, is you can literally do shout outs to talks earlier in the conference. Right, right. So they just gave a talk in this room about two hours ago about <laughs> achieving and maintaining a healthy CI with zero test flakes. And if you're curious about how things like test grid work and how it all plums together in the testing and everything, please watch that talk. And by the way, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know, if there's a test flake, it'll just rerun, right? Why is that bad? Right. So part of the reason that's bad is as a developer, and this is something I experienced, you know, I think it's just related to distributed systems. I've been seeing it since the OpenStack days, and probably others have seen it earlier than that. But as a developer, if I see that a test is failing, and then I click you know, run the test again, because I, I can't see where my code is failing, and then this time it succeeds, that might have been what we call a flake. Yeah. Some network condition con occurred, maybe uh, some endpoint failed or something. And not only is that frustrating for developers and yeah. maintainers, because it's very difficult to triage yeah. you know, what the flake was, it's also expensive. It's such a waste of resources because we have um, community resources that your, all your large providers are putting money into to make sure that, and may, putting resources into. And so we don't want to waste them on just rerunning the same test if we don't have to. Right. And, and this is something I saw, you know, like I said, back in the OpenStack days, and I think some of this behavior carries along with distributed you know, system testing. Developers get in the mindset where they're like, well, if I see a failure, the first thing I'm going to do is retest this thing like five or six <laughs> times to see, was it a flake? Have it cost five or six times as much? What could go wrong? Right. And, and if it succeeded once out of those five, then I might say, okay, that, my code works now, right? But yeah. why did it fail the other five times? And that's, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, watch that other talk. They were going into how we can reduce flakes and how we can identify them and everything. Okay. I love but, that they, they were basically just giving us a good little thing to add to our talk. Yeah, totally. it was perfect front runner for sure. Right. So what happens when we click on this failure then? Uh, that brings us to these prow logs. Uh, mm -hmm. How many people here are familiar with prow? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, a couple folks. Prow is one of the main interfaces we use to aggregate the test results. And you can see here there was a failed test. Uh, it's got a little interface that you can click through, and you can actually see the lines of code where the test failed. Yeah. And this, this is basically how any of the maintainers are probably triaging failing tests, ultimately hopefully fixing them. And 
plugging into this automation and um, is a good way to actually start connecting to the community, just seeing what's happening. Right, absolutely. And you don't need to investigate test grid to find these prow, uh, these prow interfaces. If you look at pull requests on individual projects, you'll see test reports at the bottom. And those test reports will link through to these same prow pages. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to cloud controllers, let's look specifically at what do we need to test? And cloud controller functionality has three main areas. They're not overly complicated. These are you know, just the general functionality. So one is the node controller. And that uh, does things like it, it copies over the metadata information from the cloud, like the host name, the region it's in, uh, the IP addresses. Uh, and it also has a lifecycle controller as well that can keep up to date with the instance termination status. Which is going to vary based on the provider, and so that's something that you want to be able to see. Right, exactly. You're, you're going to need uh, you know, just different code to do all those interactions. And, and if you want to test those things then, you know, it's going to be different on every cloud. And you can see some of this code now in the Kubernetes test that exists as, as scripts on how do you delete an instance on AWS or GCP or Azure so that you can properly test this thing. Yeah. Also, service tests. So load balancer style services, if you're running on a cloud that supports this and the cloud controller manager is doing it, you can actually connect those services to elastic load balancing that happens inside the infrastructure. Again, you're going to need to do special code to make sure when I create a service in Kubernetes, does the load balancer actually appear in the cloud? And so that's going to require, again, specialized code to investigate everything that happens there. Yeah. And then lastly, there's a route controller. And this uh, really helps with uh, inter-container inter communication. Not every cloud, much like the service controller, not every cloud implements a route controller. Um, and they're not used by everyone. So these might be optional depending on what your provider is. Yep. And we, by the way, you note that there is a note on the slide about additional tests. And I think that's, that's important for um, cloud uh, controllers that might deploy extra controllers. Like, for example, Azure Node Manager. Right, exactly. So this is something that is going to get uh, really interesting in these tests, right? So we're talking about a common set of tests that we can run. But on some cloud controllers, they might need to, to deploy extra things like the Azure Node Manager. And so something that we're keenly interested in investigating is if we have core tests that can be run from the Kubernetes repo, can we also make a plugin where you know the Azure Cloud Controller could have its own test to make sure that the node manager is working the way you expect it to. Yeah, and it's like extra binaries that aren't part of the core CCM. Yeah. Right, right. And this is this is where we're going to get into kind of the configuration of each cloud controller. You know, there'll be there'll have to be a way for the individual maintainers to express those configurations. And so you can kind of imagine that one of the calls to action here is we're going to need people with expertise in all of the various clouds to review the tests that we're proposing for this to make sure they actually make sense. Right, right. So how can you all out there get involved? Um, well, we've got two links here. The link on the left is a draft, very, very draft, very, very, I want to, I, I can't put enough varies in front of me. I want to say it's on HackMD. It is on HackMD right now because I just, I wanted to get something up to start expressing what we're talking about. Uh, but you can help us refine that draft. And this is a, a cap that, so right. if you're thinking, I've always wanted to be part of a Kubernetes enhancement, where do I start? Turns out you could bring your questions and expertise and ideas to this draft cap that we're getting started on about improving testing. Right, and now's the time to get in. This is the ground floor. We haven't started writing code yet. We're trying to figure out the design. So this is a great time to, if you want to kind of experience like, the life cycle of something and, like that. And this. just like literally go in and add some comments on the HackMD before we even put it in as a GitHub pull request and then come in and put, you know, issues and comments and um, whatnot on the pull request. Right, and so something else we're gonna need as well though is we're gonna need people to implement the test interfaces for each cloud provider. So if you have expertise on, on a cloud provider or multiple cloud providers, you know, your input will be invaluable in terms of helping us uh, you know, make these interfaces and also to review them. And this is all public and open source, so it does require some amount of immersing yourself in the open source cloud provider code, but it does not require you to be a subject matter expert or employed by any specific company. Right, absolutely. And I think that's a great point that I'd, I'll take a little detour here to dive into, because I think 
I talk to a lot of people who are curious about SIG Cloud Provider, and I think yeah. there's a, there's this impression that's like I need to I need to be working for you know this this company or that company to be able to make a meaningful contribution here, and. Although, yes, many people are employed by providers and they contribute their time in that way, I think if, if, you in, if you are just passionate about a platform and you know these things, you know, we are absolutely open doors for anyone who gets, wants to get involved. So, you know, on the right-hand side of the QRs here is the current tests. Like, I definitely ad advise people to take a look at what we have there now and, and help us to think about how we're going to make those better in the future. Yeah, and... We were kind of going down this list and just saying, like, when we get to the part about integrating the tests into the Cube CI, I mean, that's probably something that will require a discussion both between providers and between the Kubernetes, like, you know, infrastructure community. Right. And that leads us to, if you would like to contribute your infrastructure, um, there is a great way to do this. You can start by reaching out to projects at cncf.io um, and start a conversation with the CNCF because this is the way that you're gonna be able to contribute uh, infrastructure that you might control. Um, and you'll need to reach some sort of commitment with, you know, with the CNCF, but that, that's kind of the negotiating process here. Yeah, and it is, um, and you know, I, I work for a cloud provider, and so I can definitely tell you that it's very important for um, the Kubernetes infrastructure team to have the ability to observe the usage costs against a budget. Uh, this is not, uh, and there also needs to be technical contacts in place, agreements, et cetera. But that said, this is definitely a way to make sure that your provider is tested according yeah, to your needs. Absolutely, and I think you know, it's important to. You know, it's important to understand some of these relationships that you're going to be building because, absolutely, the Kubernetes infra team does not want to overspend with the uh, the contribution that you're making, right? So, to what Bridget was saying, the infra team is going to need the ability to observe costs within their account that they're using, and they'll also they'll also need technical contacts inside the the provider so that if something goes wrong, they have good access to experts who can help them to debug and triage. Yeah, and. If you're saying like, okay, well, that's cool. I'm not a cloud provider, so that's not relevant to me. Honestly, just back to the proposing improvements to existing tests is super important. Right. So if you would like to contribute your time, uh, these are some links that might help you out in that respect. So the link on the left is the link to our SIG cloud provider information. You can find out how to contact us, how to come to our meetings, uh, maybe how to bug Bridget and I directly. Uh, there's all sorts of different methods for communication in there. And I think that like looking at the modular cloud controller manager testing background document and then putting your comments in about where you think we're missing things. We are absolutely not going to be the only people who have ideas about what should be tested or why or exactly what is useful to you. Like you're the only people who can say this is what would be useful to us. So yeah. we really need your insights there. Yeah. And I, you know, this is where as a SIG, you know, I, I speaking for myself, and I, I, I think I can speak for Bridget on this one too, is we're completely invested in the open source methodology here, and we want to collaborate. And if you've got ideas, please come and share them with us because we try to build a, an inclusive community and we try to hear everyone out and make the best decisions, uh, you know, for the Kubernetes. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I guess we got to the end here, and I think we might have some time for questions. Looks like about six minutes. Uh, this is what I call the QR storm uh, slide. So this is kind of some, you can see the migration retrospective here, uh, a little bit of background material on modular CCM testing. This was how we started the conversation about a year ago, the draft enhancement, and then lastly, how you can get in touch with the SIG. Yeah, absolutely. And if you say, I almost feel like the migration retro is something we passed over a little bit at the beginning, but we maybe didn't say, why would somebody want to read that? Yeah, that's, you know, so if you're curious about how this whole thing happened over the course of what, seven years or something? Oh gosh, that we've been doing this so long. <laughs> <laughs> that retrospective is really telling a story. And it's telling a story about how we as a community and a project and, and maintainers came together to make a really big change in the code. And it was difficult and it was complex. And yes, it took us a while, but we wanted to reflect on what it meant to do that change with the hope that it will help people understand our community, but also yeah. maybe inform the next time we have to do something like this. And I think that there's also some value there in that big choice of moving from 
in tree to out of tree. Uh, maybe not something you don't have to do it probably now for cloud provider because we did it, but there are almost certainly technical projects in which you will have to make a big change. That big left turn where you have to figure out what to decouple and what to take apart. So there could be some actionable takeaways for people there just on yeah, their absolutely. projects in general. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I, so, you know, I do a lot of work in the cloud provider space and just cloud infrastructure in general. And this is a design pattern that comes up frequently when people are creating operators uh, for Kubernetes. You might create an operator and say, you know what, I've got this great tool. It does this really cool stuff on Kubernetes, but I want it to run on every cloud and I want it to have special interaction on every cloud, right? So when you create that operator, you might start to think, you know what, I'll just make a subdirectory for every different cloud that I want to run on and I'll put the code in here, right? Oh boy. You well, in some cases that might work, but in other cases, it might not. And hopefully, this retrospective would give you perspective then on do I want to make this kind of decision or not. Absolutely. So yeah, there's a lot here. And um, if you choose one action to take after this talk, I would say take a look at the SIG Cloud Provider info. Um, come join us on Kubernetes Slack. Uh, come to our you know meetings and figure out which, and talk to us about what you're interested in, because then we can figure out which places we can get you plugged in and contributing. Yeah, couldn't All have right. said it better. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We got a couple minutes for questions if anybody has one. I think we do have a couple minutes if people have questions. Um, I don't know, if, do we have mics back there? Yeah. yeah, I think we do have some mics on stands back there if people feel motivated to walk to um, a microphone. It's pretty quiet in here. It is pretty quiet in here, but I would have to hand people, I can hand people a mic as well if people want to ask questions. Um, we just want to capture it for the recording. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want to shout it, we'll repeat it before. I can bring a mic over if you'd like. Who, who's got questions? Let's see your hands. Oh, come on, yeah. You have to ask a question now that you said that. <laughs> that, that, what, that. That was the question. Uh, thank you. This is great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Well, I guess if there's no questions, uh, enjoy what remains of your KubeCon. Hopefully, we can savor the last few uh, delicious bites before it all ends. Thank you so much. Thanks.